I think we should. I think we should. Um, I think we should talk about Frank Church. Hello, and welcome to the Settlers of Soul podcast. I'm your host, Arius Dare. This week's guest is Peter Ward, an aspiring scholar of North Korean studies. He's a research assistant to Dr. Andre Lenkov, as well as a master's student at Seoul National University. Peter's also a researcher at the Asan Policy Institute and a contributing writer at NK News. We discuss growing up in the UK, misperceptions between the West and Korea, and how to learn Korean effectively. You can connect with Peter on Twitter at rpcward89, that's rpcward89. And just some quick housekeeping, if you like the show, please share it with your friends, rate us on iTunes, Twitter, Facebook, you know, whatever you use, just to get it out there. I've already received several recommendations for future guests. Would love to hear from you, the listeners, who we should interview and what kind of topics you care about. Okay, let's get to the show. I'm sitting here with Peter Ward of London, UK, formerly of the European Union. Peter is just a, a really brilliant guy. He speaks Korean like nobody I've ever met, including the people I've seen on TV. I thought the first thing that I would ask is, at what point did you decide, I guess, did you make the conscious decision that you're going to devote all this time to Korean? Well, why not Japanese? Why not French? Why not Somali? You know, when I was at school, I hated studying foreign languages. I hated it so much. My initial experience was disinterest. Where but then, did you go to school? So I went to school in uh, southwest London in a place called Surbiton, which is very near Kingston and Wimbledon, which I'm sure your listeners will have heard of, the tennis tournament. Mm -hmm. I actually grew up in Wimbledon and then moved to uh, New Alden when I was nine. And that's right near Surbiton. So I, um, I started with French and I was not very interested, although I have fond memories of my teacher. And then I was moved up classes gradually, and they immediately put me in a German class, which had already done German for a year, and I did not find it to my liking, and I never really got the hang of it, never really tried. I recently read a piece in The Economist. I, I don't, I'd actually, I don't think it was The Economist. It was their 1843 magazine. And it, it said that uh, despite being in the European Union for decades, French, German, Spanish uh, language learners has declined something like half in the UK. Mm -hmm. How would you rate the language learning community in London, uh, in Southwest London, in, in Wimbledon? Well, uh, so I actually studied at school when I was, let's say I started when I was 11. So that would have been by the time I'd moved to New Malden out of Wimbledon. So I'd be rating the, that community. But I would say, generally speaking, most people continue to take a GCSE, which is the uh, qualification that you do uh, between 15 and 16 at school. They continue to take a GCSE in language. Some go on to an A-level, which is between 16 and 18, but most do not. I would say that most people, the general perception in London, which is allegedly a global city, and basically, I suppose, is in the, fact, in, in the sense that over half of its population come from outside of the UK. The general perception is that it's a global city, so people will speak foreign languages. And the uh, native population of British passport holders who were born there, including you know people from all around the world, but you know probably predominantly white, will also make an effort to speak foreign languages and be global, quote-unquote. But that's not really true. Uh, most don't. And most don't speak foreign languages to any appreciable degree. Uh, and that's not a new thing. It's not, you know, if you talk to my mum about language speaking, I remember her telling me that, oh, your father's good at foreign languages. Well, I and understand your mother is an immigrant as well. My mum's American. But she's, you know, she's white and uh, very English. And if you met her, you wouldn't know she's American. But if... You know, she was very uh, proud of the fact that my father could speak foreign languages and the extent of it was he'd know a few Latin words and he could order food at a restaurant in Menorca. And to me, that's not speaking foreign language. That's not speaking foreign languages to any second. In Trump's uh, America, uh, that's speaking a foreign language. <laughs> You're qualified for the State Department. <laughs> um, I don't know if Ivanka speaks a foreign language, but his wife certainly does. <laughs> she speaks English after all. So I don't know about that. And I think Trump may actually have some quite a lot of respect for foreign language speakers because... At least Russian speakers. Where's Melania from? Slovakia? Slovenia? I think they have their own languages. <laughs> anyway, Slavonic language, people of Slavonic family. But no, in just going back, so I started uh, school learning French and then moved up to a German class, gave up. And it was not considered to be a big deal. And it still isn't. You know, most people in my community do not speak a foreign language to any appreciable degree. Speaking foreign language is a sign of intellectualism, culturedness, all of that kind of stuff. And most people don't aspire to such things in any culture. So how old were you when you first, I guess, were exposed to Korea or Korean? Uh, was, it, was it a show that you liked? Was it a girl that you dated? Uh, you mentioned that you had a, a crush on your French teacher. 
Was there a, don't have a crush on my was there, teacher. Was there a cute Korean girl in your class that sparked your interest? Um, no. Uh, so actually, I, I, that's the strange thing about this. I moved house when I was eight years old, almost nine. And I lived in a community which apparently they used to say, I'm not sure if it's true. I don't think it is true, but has the largest population of South Koreans outside of South Korea, which is clearly not true because they're obviously in China. They're going to be in Yantai or you know, Qingdao or somewhere like that. But anyway, there were a lot of uh, South Koreans there, and I was not interested at all. And I, I had South Korean uh, classmates when I was at uh, junior school, um, and I remember there being South Koreans at high school too. I had no interest whatsoever. What was their reputation back then? Was it kind of the, uh, the Asian kids that nobody associated with? Were they the ones that were good at math? Did they integrate quite well? They were not considered to be... They are not considered to be good integrators. They're considered to be clannish, insular. They... Well, the ones who speak English, obviously, are considered to be reason, very, very smart, most of them. But the ones who, you know, it's a generational thing. So people my age, generally speaking, at school, a lot of them speak good English. Not all of them, and some of them are, you know, very fresh arrivals from South Korea. But a lot of them speak good English. I remember one of my close friends at uh, junior school, junior school is uh, in, in England from 8 to 11, was Korean. And he was part of our group. There were two of them, actually. Um, their Koreanness did factor into it in as much as they spoke slightly awkward English. They were much loved, and no one was in the slightest bit interested in their culture. They were just normal human beings. But their parents and their grandparents, if they live here, uh, sorry, live in, in the UK, generally speaking, do not have as positive relations with people of my parents' and grandparents' generation. They're considered to be clean, tidy, clannish, closed. A good immigrants, unlike those people from certain parts of the Asian subcontinent who bring their you know, radical Islam with them, if they do. Now, is this indicative of all East Asians or, or Koreans in particular? I, I, I know that in the U.S., uh, in the Asian American community, Koreans have a particular reputation of being extraordinary cliquish uh, and insular, uh, as you put it. Uh, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans to, to, to various extents. But I think Koreans, at least on the West Coast where I grew up, had that kind of reputation. Well, most British people don't know anything about Korea, and they're not interested. South Korea, North Korea, neither. They may know North Korea because of the nuclear weapons, because of the leadership being completely ridiculous. You know, you look at Kim Jong-un on TV and he looks ridiculous to most English people. Most British people are not interested in Asia. You know, most British people are not interested in Spain, let alone Asia. You know, most countries are usually weather, maybe other enjoyable outdoor activities, the cheapness of alcohol, maybe the cheapness of sex if if you're into prostitutes, and... Yeah, the taste of the food, the spice. Most people do not think of the socioeconomic and political complexities of countries. They might consider the way people look. They might consider the way people behave in social situations if it's awkward. Um, They have certain stereotypes. And those stereotypes can be very highly sort of differentiated and sophisticated when the interaction between your country and their country has been going on for hundreds or thousands of years. More often than not, if it's not a country near you, so for instance with the British, if it's not the French, the Germans, and the Spanish, and even then, you know, the Spanish are considered to be emotional and irrational. They've got cheap food, uh, which is very tasty. They have nice weather and good beaches. But with Asia, very little, very little knowledge of the place. Korea is the unknown, and Korea is considered to be just like Japan. And, you know, a lot of people think Samsung and Hyundai are Japanese companies. I mean, it's understandable. It may be very upsetting for South Koreans to hear. I think most people in London have heard the name, have heard the word Korea before, may know a little bit about Korean food because there's lots of Korean restaurants in London now, but they don't, they can't really differentiate that which is Japanese and that which is Korean and yeah, Korea is not understood. It's the same, it's the same in the US. Um, a lot of Koreans like to point to Gangnam style as proof of Korea's globalness of their Korean culture and K-pop and K-drama. I don't know how many Americans actually connected Korea with Gangnam Style, much less even knew size background or what the lyrics meant or had any curiosity. You know, this is a constant theme in Korea's, South Korea's cultural relations with the world. It's this massive, massive insecurity vis-a-vis the West and their neighbors. So I like Paco de Lucia. Um, I don't know where he's from. I think he's Spanish. But Spanish people don't really care that I like Paco de Lucia. If I say to a Spanish person, I really like Paco de Lucia, the um, flamenco guitarist. He's a great guitarist, great. Or I like Albanese. Spanish people don't go, oh my God, that's our culture, you know. They don't care. South Koreans do. A lot of them do anyway. And 
that's because they are chronically insecure about their culture and their place in the world. Where do you think that stems from? Is that a, is that a modern construct? I think the 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 basic political reasons have existed for a very long time. But I think the idea of globalizing your culture and exporting it around the world is quite new, at least for smaller countries. Smaller countries like South Korea, like um, Ireland, no offense to the Irish, uh, you know, like Switzerland, uh, like many countries in the world have not been interested in, you know, many still aren't, but um, have not been interested in internationalizing their culture and spreading it around. But the idea of a cultural industry, you know, there are many reasons why South Korea is very, very insecure. And some of them relate to the fact that it's a divided country and it literally is physically insecure. It was it was physically insecure vis-a-vis -vis China and Japan, uh, especially during the open ports period of 1876 to 1910 as well. It had to, ended up being colonized for heaven's sake. But, you know, it is, it is, a, it is the smallest country in its region and it's, so it's surrounded by powers that do not wish it well and would like to dominate it and control it. So that's where some of the insecurity comes from. And that's not new. This new cultural insecurity, though, I think it stems from the colonial period. I think it stems from the Japanese turning up, colonizing the place and trying to destroy Korean culture. And once the Japanese left, uh, the state that emerged was avowedly anti-Japanese. It was built in the image of the ideologies of the, the, the nationalist, anti-imperialist struggle movement that Korean independence fighters, basically. And it's their worldview, which is in the constitution, which is in the education system. And it's not only avowedly anti-Japanese, but it is chronically insecure. And yeah. Now, it, do you think, do you think that global promotion comes from 35 years of really, really what you could call it as cultural genocide, where the Japanese uh, barred the Korean language in public spaces, uh, required Japanese textbooks, tried to really stamp out a lot of the spiritual and religious communities and that rather than adopt that what you had here so rather than taiwan which embraced a lot of what japan offered as early as the 1890s korea was fighting tooth and nail at every step of the way and so when the japanese left in 1945 it was as if the the clouds had dispersed the sun came out and there was almost this kind of um fervent desire or or, or push to re-Koreanize what had been for 35 years very Japanese, that had for 35 years been stamped out, been discouraged, been punished, and that we're actually still seeing that rebound effect uh, some 70 years later. Okay, so we have to ask what is what is Korean and uh, what is Korean uh, that was Korean before Japan arrived? And what is that thing that is being recovered? Japan did not initiate a campaign of cultural genocide in 1905 or 1910. It's, it's, it's a complex record. Uh, the Korean textbooks would have, you know, they emphasize the worst parts of Japanese colonialism, like the sex slavery, the forced conscription of Korean soldiers, although they don't talk about that as much as the sex slavery, with, for good reason. And the cultural, the forcing, you know, the, the, the forcible name changes in the late 1930s, forcing all Koreans to change their names, and banning of the Korean language. But that occurred in the 1930s in quite a narrow block of time. For much of the colonial period, you know, between 1919 and 1930, you had a policy that was far more moderate and was quite quietly encouraging of, you know, Korean language. This is Korean particularly true in the 1920s. Right, right, right. Now, you can obviously argue, which Korean nationalist historians do, and they're probably correct to argue that this was a, a compromise that Japan made with, South, with Korean civil society and with, Korean, Korean, with the Korean people in order to not provoke another you know, nationwide protest like uh, on, that started on March the 1st, 1919. So, yeah, there's that. Uh, but anyway, you know, the colonial period was not this uniform period of suffering and despair for everyone at all times. And then next, Korean culture. Look, I'm not, I'm not a specialist of the Chosun period, but I am, I do know that, uh, almost all official documents were written in classical Chinese. Classical Chinese was the language of state. And a lot of what Koreans identify as being intrinsically Korean was looked down upon and dis just basically despised by the elite. Uh, at least, you know, the literary stuff and the language, you know, obviously material culture, you know, your food, your housing, that kind of stuff. It was obviously they had their own way of doing things, but at least at the high cultural level, or, or it was almost entirely, you know, non, avowedly anti-Korean in the modern sense. So there is also that. And like, finally, I, I, I just think that the insecurity 
I don't know. But what I would say is with Taiwan, the comparison to Taiwan is very apt, but very interesting too, because I don't know why the Chinese are so much less anti-Japanese. But I think it's a political choice. I think Chiang Kai-shek decided not to alienate the Japanese, decided not to pick a fight with the Japanese, and Lee Sin-man decided to. He instituted an extremely anti-Japanese education policy, where Japan was basically vilified as the devil, even as he was taking, you know, even as his continuing bilateral trade relations and taking some support during the Korean War. You know, this is. This is a man who basically did his absolute utmost to create a memory of the colonial period that was uniformly awful, and try to put instill in the minds of Koreans that their nation depended upon them hating Japan. And if you, you know, you go back to Korea in 1945, they're going to have a very complex. They're going to say very complex things about Japan, you know. And if you read Korean history textbooks, it has to be all bad. If you talk to the average lay Korean. And you say, oh, but you know the Japanese did some good things too. It's a mixed record. It's basically bad. All all colonialism is bad. Japanese colonialism in the 1930s was horrendous, and in the 40s, but it's a mixed record. You know, you're you're talking to a brick wall. You're going to get a lot of anger, and people are going to go, what about the comfort women?、Uh, or you know, let's call them what they were, sex slaves. What about Japan's policy of trying to destroy Korean culture? And you go, well, yeah, no, no, absolutely. The Chinese have a very similar attitudes towards Japan too, and maybe it's just fine. Maybe, maybe it's just fine that they hate Japan. After all, Japan is a declining economic hegemon in the region. You know, China is the rising power. You know, Japanese innovation is not what it once was. The country is very indebted. You know, there are good arguments for why Korea doesn't really need to care that much about Japan. <laughs> I, they're, they're not very good, but there are some arguments anyway. So take us back to London. Yeah. You said that you had a, a close Korean friend. Did you learn Korean at that time? Was 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 he exposing you to the the current events? So I had I have one memory of Korea coming up in conversation、uh, when I was eight, and it was we were looking at a globe, and the guy I the guy pointed to North Korea, and he said, "My mom told me that people there are starving," which was really horrifying, and it remains in my memory. And that was about nineteen ninety seven, and that's. All the memories I have of anything career-related ending up in conversation. At what point did that change? At what point did you start to learn more about Korea, about the language? I became interested in Korea in 2006 when North Korea tested missiles and then tested nuclear weapons. I became interested in the idea of learning the language much later. But I entertained an interest in the in the society, economy, and politics of North Korea from about 2006. How was the nuclear test received in the UK in 2006? This was still the Tony Blair days. The Iraq War was still going on. Was this another axis of evil、uh, enemy that needed to be liberated? Was it fear? Was it anger? What was the reaction that you remember? My mum is the reason why I think I like good journalism. She she is not very interested in how journalism is done. She's not. She's not a media expert, but she has very, very good taste in news. So she used to buy the Independent, which is a centrist newspaper, and very, very anti-Iraq War and very, very anti-Blair because of the Iraq War. And she would listen to BBC Radio Four every day,、uh, usually in the morning and in the evening. And she'd also watch News Twenty Four, BBC News Twenty Four, which is a twenty-four hour news channel run by the BBC.、Mm-hmm. North Korea has always been covered as a threatening, menacing country, and potentially a threat to the world through proliferation and、uh, the eventual development of ICBMs. But it was not, never portrayed as the evil part of the axis of evil. But nonetheless, the BBC, of course, would cover it very quite critically. And yes, there would be a lot of discussion of what the implications are of the nuclear test, what the missile, why, why the regime is doing this, what the regime is, that kind of stuff. And yeah, it was it was headline news, and it was all over the place when it happened. They had coverage from the the UN Security Council. I remember they would have these very amusing、uh, clips from the, from the Chosun Chungang Pangsong. What's that in English? The、um, Korean Central Television. You know what they're like. The anchors in the, on the on North Korean TV can be comical, and the BBC took full advantage of that. And it was just f- for me in two thousand six. It was just awe inspiringly, incredibly exciting and terrifying, and all of those kind of things. So it was, in fact, North Korea that got you interested in the peninsula. It wasn't a K drama or a K pop band or the the Hallyu wave that I think a lot of people here, non Koreans,、uh, ultimately is kind of their first exposure、uh, to Korea. You're watching the news. You're listening to the radio.、Uh, what was the next step for you? Did you decide to enroll in a language Korean course? Did you start to read books? 
Well, so the thing is, like, why would someone who sees missile tests and nuclear nuclear weapons tests on TV go, oh, I want to study that. Oh, I'm interested in that. Uh, there's a context to that, which is that I was studying the Soviet Union and I had been interested in dictatorships since I was since I was 12, 13. I had entertained an interest in Nazism, not because I'm a fan of Nazism, I've never been a fan of Nazism, but I entertained an interest in the Nazi regime and the history of Nazism. And also, then I started studying the Soviet Union in history class at school. And I was, this was at the time when I was reading Marx and I was studying philosophy and I was also studying Soviet history. And North Korea was the last Stalinist country on earth. And I was absolutely fascinated. So I started by going to the internet and looking it up and reading t columns in the Korea Times and freecareer.us, uh, the blog run by Joshua Stanton, various other things. Uh, and that's where it began. I began basically with what the human rights and nuclear stuff and uh, the, and Wikipedia had to had to say about North Korea, and then went from there. I think I started reading actual books about North Korea about a year later. But yeah, that's how it began. I was not interested in the Korean language at all, to be honest. At that point, I was still interested in it was kind of a side interest to Russia so I was actually studying Russian and that's basically how my career journey began and I gave up I was no good at studying Russian in the UK uh, and I gave that up quite quickly but I didn't get interested in the idea of studying the language until much much later when did that start to change when did you start to see the Korean language as as an investment worth making <sighs> it's kind of difficult to explain and it is very very personal uh, in a kind of sort of pathetic teenage way so I won't go into too much detail it was but a girl. It was a girl, uh, of course. And that is really when the idea of going to Korea dawned on me. I was besotted with someone and I enrolled in a language program for the summer at Korea University through my first university before I transferred to Korea University. Applied and got into an exchange program also at Korea University for 2010. So I went out there in 2009, fell in love with the place. And around July 2009, I met my boss, Andre Lankoff, who you may have heard of. I sent him an email, just basically cold emailed him as opposed to cold calling him. I went to his office and the first thing he basically said to me, because I had written him this gushing email where I said he was my hero and I wanted to do the things that he's doing. And I, even then, it hadn't really dawned on me that I had to study the language that hard and that the language was that important. So English of me. So I went to his office and he basically said you got to come here, you got to study Korean and learn Korean. And I'd already enrolled in my exchange program and I'd already read, you know, 15 books on the country. And he was impressed and he, and then he said, I explained that my exchange program would last four months. And he was like, no, 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 that's not enough time. He would have said it in his lovely rasping Russian voice. you got to be here for two years. So he wrote a letter to my university and he wrote a letter to my mum explaining the situation. The university gave me extraordinary leave of absence for two years after I finished my exchange semester in June 2010. And I spent the next year and a half studying Korean. That's basically how my journey with Korean began. It began with Andrew Lankov, whose books I'd already read, who I was a huge fan of, uh, and then who I met. But even even before I met him, I, I remember I had a plan, but it was very different. My plan was I'd finish my degree in England, I'd go to Korea, I'd work as an English teacher, and then maybe study the language and then figure out what to do with it. But I had no specific plan. And Andre gave me that plan. And that's that's the plan that I followed. Uh, for those that don't know, could you give a quick introduction? So my boss, Andre Lankov, Professor Andre Lankov of Kungmin University. He was born in Leningrad in 1963. He studies North Korean daily life, society and the economy. He's written books about the August incident, uh, which was a, a failed attempt to depose Kim Il-sung in 1956. He's also written general books about Korean modernity and is now working on a very large project related to markets and post-socialism in North Korea uh, since the 1980s. So this was a good person to get a letter from, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, no, it impressed uh, my university enough for them to do that. And my mum was not very happy about the idea of me relocating to Korea, but she she accepted it. So, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So you went from more or less zero Korean experience in 2010 to getting your undergraduate degree entirely in Korean, writing papers in Korean, attending Korean lectures in 2014 in just well, four years. I mean, I started writing essays in 2012. I'm sure my professors really didn't enjoy reading them, but they're, not them. They're Chogyos, they're, <laughs> they're teaching assistants. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we need to add those five weeks I did at Korea University in 2009 as well. 
your rate of progress is really remarkable. For those who have tried to learn Korean can tell you, it's a really difficult language. The vast, vast, vast majority of Westerners that live in Seoul, that live in Korea, have very limited engagement with the language, very limited understanding. Uh, and similar to you, when you were younger, uh, very limited curiosity. What was different for you that you feel you were able to make these giant strides in such a short amount of time? So I would say that it's a case of having to. I felt that if I failed at Korean, I wouldn't have any other options. And I mean, it's insane, but it was the way I thought. You know, this was my one way of escaping into something I found interesting and something I enjoyed, which is, you know, studying North Korea. And so I threw myself into it, and it was really, really hard. Le the, the most difficult thing about learning Korean is listening. Uh, I mean, like, learning how to write and write perfectly is impossible, you know. Most people will never get to the point in Korean where their writing is perfect. But listening was the is the real challenge as a beginner. As an advanced learner, yes, it's going to be writing. But as a beginner, it's listening. Because I'm sure you're familiar with this, but it's a, it's a language that sort of just slurs together. Words become one. Sounds are very indistinct, and there is a lot of pronunciation change depending on which particles you use. or what, you know how the, how, the, how the sentence is structured really affects the way it sounds. So learning how to listen in it is really hard. Yeah. What kind of material did you use? Was there a particular textbook, uh, podcasts, vocabulary? Okay, so for level one, I used the Chimin and Hangugo from Koryo uh, Deakyo from Korea University. And I'd like to give a shout out to my long suffering uh, level one teacher, uh, Huang Sansing. Level two, I used the Yonsei textbook because I was at Kungmin University with Andre for, th for uh, 10 weeks before I went to Busan. For level three, I used the Yonsei textbook, which I studied on my own, and I also used topic materials, past papers, the topic, uh, the Korean uh, test for proficiency topic, Hangul on Nung I I used their materials and I used their listening materials. I knew listening was my, my weakness. Uh, for level four, five, and six, I used Chimin and Hangul again, uh, the Korean university textbook, because I was at Korean university for that year. Never really been able, I've only just escaped Korean university recently, and I still have a real fondness for the place. Right? My trick was to copy my friend Garrity, which is use the textbook, use lots of different materials, rote memorize large tons of vocabulary using flashcards and constant repetition. You repeat, write it, you repeat, read it, and you repeat, listen, and you listen. And then once you've gotten to a basic level of intermediate fluency, you get out of your safe space as much as possible. So I would listen. In, in 2011, I spent a lot of time read, listening to Sonsoki Shisan Chipjung, which is now Son Dong Ho, I think, does it now. Shin Dong Ho. But that was a radio show. I would listen to that. I'd listen to the podcast of that for an hour. When I started, I could understand about 5% over the course of a year. So from the beginning of 2011, I got up to the point where I could understand 70 or 80%. And that was, you know, obviously language school was key. You know, you want immersion. That was just sort of ancillary. You know, the podcast was sort of ancillary. It was just an add-on. But it was a great way of tracking my progress, and it was also a great way of experiencing the language firsthand. And if you, li if you can hear it, you can say it, you know, seven times out of ten. If you can hear it, you can say it, eventually. And that was really, really helpful. Apart from that, I also read some books, uh, just Korean books, stuff about North Korea mainly. There's another secret, but I'm not sure if I should talk about it on a podcast, but I think you can read between the lines. It's not, it's not what you think it is. Is it a girl? It's a girl. <laughs> why do you think that the level of attainment of... Why do you think that... Why, why do you think white guys suck at Korean? Um, just say that. Just ask that. Why do white guys suck at Korean? Just do that. <laughs> so It's much more honest. <laughs> why do white guys suck at Korean? Because they have no reason to learn it. Like what, With language learning, there's two reasons. There are three factors, okay? There's biology. So some people just do not have the brains to do it or they're too old. And, you know, like the older you get, the more difficult it is to learn a language and to learn it fluently. Sorry, I know it's very ageist of me. But the other two reasons are one, purpose. Two, motivation. So you can have the most lofty purpose in the world, the most lofty reason in the world for learning the language. But if you're not motivated and if that purpose doesn't get you out of bed and make you work, then you're never going to learn. And Korean, Korean is very similar to Turkish and Hungarian grammatically, which means it should be easier for them to learn. And it probably is. For, so far as I can tell, I have a, I know a professor who speaks fluent Hungarian, and he's Korean, and he went there in the 1990s. But I also know a Hungarian who doesn't speak fluent Korean, and he lives here. So, and, you know, one of the most famous people on TV, and one of the most famous interpreters until he 
got into trouble with the media was Turkish and his Korean was phenomenal, right? So now I'm a, I'm a sociologist and I just want to give you, I, I'm retraining as a sociologist as we speak. And I like sociology. I also like economics. I like politics too. But anyway, I want to give you my sociological spiel, spiel as to why it is difficult for white people to learn Korean. And for foreigners in general, I just to, assumed you were racist and you were making blanket well, generalizations. Well, you know, I would I would say that it's not just it's not white people; it's Westerners. And you know, you can be West uh, Westerness is a cultural thing; it's not a, a racial thing. You know, there there were loads of Westerners at my school in London. Many of them weren't white. So we're talking really about Westerners. Anyway, so why is it difficult for Westerners to learn Korean? Well, it's partially um, and there's no there's very few pull factors into this society. You know, it's there's not a lot of money here for a highly skilled, high-performing Westerner to learn Korean. There's not a lot of money which would motivate them to learn Korean. You know, they can, usually if you want to work for a Chebo, you know, large conglomerate, or you want to work for someone who has money, which is usually a Chebo, you don't need to speak Korean. You know, they will, you, you, you used to work at Hanwha, you know this very well, you've got very good practical experience with this. Hanwha is a large Korean conglomerate. And they're not interested in having white people, sorry, Westerners in their staff who are fluent Korean speakers. They don't need them. They've got translators, they've got interpreters, and they've got lots of English speakers in their staff too, to boot, just general staff. So there are very few commercial economic inducements to learn Korean. Now, socially, why is it difficult for a Westerner to learn Korean? Well, it's difficult for anyone to learn Korean, because Korean society is very closed. What does that mean in practice? Korean society is ordered according to three basic ordering principles, so far as Koreans are concerned anyway, and so far as their sociologists are concerned. Maybe, maybe they're all wrong. But the th three basic things that determine your background, your networks, your friendship groups, etc. are your hagyeon, chiyeon, and hyoryeon. Hagyeon is where you went to school, your school network. Your chiyeon is your regional network where you lived and live, your hometown, etc., depending on you know, where that is and where, you've, where you grew up. Uh, and your hyoryeon is your blood connections, so your relatives, uh, your immediate family, your uncles, your aunts, their, their friends, that kind of thing. Now, as a foreigner, you have none of these things in this society. Uh, you have a work connection, but usually your work connection doesn't determine your future work, and it, doesn't det it does not determine your uh, social status and security in and of itself. I have two of those connections. So I have a girlfriend, a wonderful girl, and she's my sorry ladies she's she's my quasi family connection i have hagyeon i have uh, school connections you know i have people who i went to school with who i did my undergrad with that's one of the that was a very smart thing that i didn't understand at the time but in retrospect i have some very close friends from school and i would not know them if i hadn't gone to school with them and it is very difficult to make very close friendships outside of your three connection groups you can meet people, but actually becoming really close friends to them when you are not in those networks is difficult. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. And that makes it really difficult to study the language, to get good at it, and also to be motivated to study it and to have a purpose in studying it. More often than not, you are par if you are going to be a high-performing foreigner from the West who is going to get a job in this society, you're going to be parachuted in as usually a white face. No offense. It can be non-white face, but usually a white face who speaks English and who presents a global han, you know, global image of the company. So why would you learn Korean? And if you're a foreigner who is not interested in um, getting a corporate job, well, there's not really much else here that'll pay you reasonably well, apart from English teaching at the high end. And English teaching is quite a stressful job from what I've heard from English teachers. And you don't usually want to do it forever in Korea. Some people do. Some people are very successful. Some people who I would call my friends, very close friends, who are English teachers, but it's not, it's not usually something that the average 25 year old or 22 year old or 20 year old comes here imagining a future career with and then goes off and studies Korean too. It doesn't make any sense. You're they're still there just as an English speaker. So you wouldn't have much motivation or perhaps much time to study the language in any great depth. So you've been in Korea more or less continuously for the last seven years. No, I was in China for 14 months and I also. I, I like to subtract extra months because Koreans use it in their... You can see a lot of people use it in a scorecard in their head. Oh, you've studied the language seven years? Okay, then, you know, you 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 should be this good. But if you say to them, oh, no, I only I was only was I've only been in the country for five and a half years total, minus the time I spent in China and at home, it's only five and a half years, then you get more credit and brownie points. So let's say I've lived... I have actually only lived in Korea during that time of five and a half years. Five and a half years, and you're obviously at a full professional proficiency... What have you done with your Korean language skills? What, what, what are things that you feel just would not be attainable uh, had you not devoted the serious hard work? So I think that there are very 
few things I've done with the language up until now, which are going to be remembered by anyone except me. For what it's worth, I have done a few things. I have translated some books. I've translated various other things, but the books will probably, one or, one or two of the books will probably be remembered. I have made some very, very close friends who will probably be very close friends for the rest of my life. And I have been involved in a research project with my boss, Andre, interviewing North Korean refugees uh, about marketization in North Korea from the 1980s onwards. And I think the marketization project, though it's in its infancy, will go on to produce something great. Several books, quite a lot of articles. But we've, we've only just begun. So you've kept your focus on North Korea since you've been here. Well, you know, it's funny because I did actually study Korean history and, you know, I have done some translation, so not entirely. And I'm much less focused on North Korea than I was when I first came. And I'm not actually, it's funny, whenever anyone talks about North Korea, more often than not, they're talking about politics or they're talking about nuclear program. They sometimes talk about human rights too, but less often. When they bring this stuff up in conversation, you know, all the latest purge, the latest missile test, etc., I glaze over and I usually not don't have much in the way of profound things to say about North Korean politics because I'm not interested. Not really. I'm much more interested in American politics. I'm interested in North Korean society and why North Korean society works because it does work. You know, As a sociologist, I would expect that answer. Sorry. Yeah. Well, you know, in, I do like to dabble in all of these things, but as someone who does study society and study people and relationships... I'm very interested in how a place that is so often condemned and is the subject of, is the object, sorry, of so many international sanctions continues to work and, you know, has its own bizarre and rather grotesque in some regards logic that nonetheless works socially. It's because Korea is the only country with four seasons. That's how it works. Yeah, and great kimchi and doenjang, you know, as in like, I think the globalization of Korean food is great. So I'll make lots of jokes about that kind of stuff, but can I just go on the record as saying that I really like Korean food? And I think that there's going to be loads of people worldwide when they're introduced to Tuenjang Jjigae or Cheonggukjang, my absolute favorite. They're going to love it. I, I think a big problem with Korean food is presentation. Some other cultures, let's say Japan, uh, spend a lot of time on how it looks, how it's presented, how different flavors fit with different moods. Uh, Korean food is much less pretentious. Korean food is is, is very much... Here you go. And I know that, that in the last, say, 10, 15 years, as Korea has, has modernized and become uh, a very rich country, there has been more of a focus on making the food look, look very pretty. But I think for most intents and purposes, if you go to a sundaeguk place, right, you're going to get a bowl of rice, a steaming black bowl of, of soup with a little um, a blood sausage kind of, kind of in there. And it's delicious and it tastes great, right? But it just doesn't I think, seem palatable to a lot of the international community. Uh, the international community, what we're really talking about again is uh, Western Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, I take it. White guys. <laughs> yeah, all right. Western people. So I think that we're really talking about the West when we're talking about the globalization of Korean food. Because I went to China and I lived in China for 14 months. And I can assure you there was plenty of Korean food in China. I, I've been to Japan. Uh, only for a holiday, granted. But I assure you, there is lots of Korean food in Japan. It's not just because I'm looking for it. It's there. Outside of East Asia, Korean food is not very well known. When we're talking about cuisine and we're talking about food, we're talking about Western people going to restaurants. Now, there's several ways you can tackle this and unpack it. Like Italian food comes in many different varieties. And some of it is expensive and presented in a gourmet fashion as some kind of quote-unquote ethnic food. I hate the term. Some of it is just a part of normal diet now. You know, paninis, pizza, pasta, various different kinds of pasta, lasagna, risotto. People make this stuff in their homes and they make it in many different varieties. The most unremarkable people you think of in Britain who have no interest whatsoever in anything related to the outside world, pretty much, will nonetheless cook fabulous risotto at home. Or cook Indian food at home. They cook a bauti at home, chicken bauti. Or they'll cook, they'll cook Anglo-Indian cuisine quite well. You know, you can have a really nice Indian meal in an average home in London or in, outside of London. You know, Wales. You can have an Indian meal in Wales. I was recently in D.C. actually. And I, I think that a lot of Korean food could be really easily popularized at the mass level. You take something like doenjang jjigae or kimchi jjigae. And you could serve it as a soup in Albon, in a, like an a American bakery. 
in a reasonably globalized, quote unquote, place like New York or Washington, D.C., you could have large numbers of chain delis serving Korean food in one form or another, be it kimbap or it be one of the jjigae's in like a soup pot, which you know, maybe you can eat with rice or maybe you can eat with bread. It doesn't have to be served as something upscale and expensive. It doesn't have to be made into some kind of pretentious gourmet experience in order to be popularized. To return to North Korea, uh, is North Korea portrayed differently in Korean news media versus the English world? What are some big differences? I would say that actually what's really amusing is the remarkable degree of similarity. So North Korea's okay, there's more emphasis on human rights uh, in the Western press and more emphasis on the threat and security issues in the Korean press, but it's marginal. I'd say actually the press, the popular press, has a very similar view of North Korea. The only difference is Western journalists can go to North Korea. South Korean journalists usually can't and don't. So they get the whole sort of touristy experience and many of them, you know, many of them leave the place thinking that it's a communist hellhole. With regard to books, I would say Koreans have a far more textured and sophisticated understanding of North Korea, which has a lot to do with the fact that they read the documents, they interview the refugees, they work with refugees. There's some really great refugee scholars in South Korea now. What do you think is the biggest misconception the biggest in, the, in the West that, that this doesn't exist here? There are two big misconceptions then. So one is North Korea will want to give up its nuclear weapons and the North Korean people would like their government to give up nuclear weapons given suitable inducements. And two, North Korean society is still Stalinist and North Korean the North Korean economy is still basically dominated by the Kim family. I mean, certain sectors are, many are not. Think about Western attitudes towards China and the way the West thinks of China. Now, Americans, how do they perceive China? They perceive it as the place where all their jobs went, a geopolitical threat, a rising power, and a repressive authoritarian regime. And they honestly believe, a lot of people seem to honestly believe, that if China became a democracy, it would be more pro-American. I don't think it would be. By the same token, a lot of people in the West, and even in South Korea, believe that the North Korean people would like their country to become democratic and non-nuclear. I don't know. I don't know. I don't necessarily think North Koreans living in North Korea care that much about the political system. I mean, they would like it to be less repressive, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily want to introduce multi-party democracy. I think the idea, especially when our country was being borne down upon by the, the Soviets, um, the idea of having an independent nuclear deterrent, if you're being borne down upon by the American imperialists, they're not really imperialists, and I'm not anti-American, but that's the way you're educated from birth in North Korea. Um, when you're being borne down upon by this threat, the idea of having nuclear weapons sounds like a great one. And the idea of your state, which represents your culture to some extent, having nuclear weapons is a source of great national pride, surely. You mentioned an ongoing research project with Dr. Lankoff where you're interviewing North Korean defectors uh, about their experience in the country. Is there a particularly noteworthy interview that you and Dr. Lankoff just looked at each other after and you thought, wow, there have been quite a few, but I would say one of my absolute favorites was a North Korean refugee who I will not go into any more detail about, who used to steal antiques from North Korea. And I remember him talking about how he would go to these old tombs from a thousand years ago or more and go grave robbing and how he made loads of money doing it. And this was in a country where people were practically starving to death and he needed to feed his household, he needed to make money. I just remember talking to him about it and I came away from it afterwards and I said, that is an incredible man. And it's it's so memorable because I'm, I really respect him and I really like him. Someone who survived and prospered under that in that system. <laughs> Grave robbing is, is not exactly um, something that I think of as being particularly morally... Uh, it's a bit of a moral grey area, North shall we Korean say. Korean grey robbing, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, they were the graves of kings and nobles and all that kind of stuff. Well, graves of kings. and Yeah, so, you know, it's national heritage being plundered. So that was one. Um, another one was a, a man who ran a bus company. And talking to him about the mechanics of how you run a bus company in North Korea... That was really interesting. Dealing with the system as it is and making money and employing people the way it just was obviously so normal. That was from that was his society. That's how he saw, you know, that's what he'd grown up there. That's all he'd ever known. And he would, you know, just, of course, it's natural to go to the local, local people's committee or local state police guy and say, I want to start a bus company. I've got this money. I've got these investors. Um, we're going to get the buses from here. Now, I need to register it with you. So we're going to pretend it's your company. And then I'll pay you 
this much a month. And the guy goes, Mm-mm, you're going to pay this much a month. And then you go, I'm not sure if I can generate that much revenue. I'm not sure if it's possible. Why don't we just go for this number in between? And he goes, oh, okay, let's do that. That just comes completely naturally. They don't have corporate law. They don't have private property rights. They don't have a, a court system that will enforce commercial rights or contracts. And yet, for some reason, they have capitalism and they have businesses and they have people who make money, make profits, and seem to own stuff and seem to prosper. It's very, very interesting. In a similar vein to that previous question, what do you think the Western media gets wrong about South Korea, South Korean politics, society, culture? I think there's a danger with Asian societies of always interpreting um, them through their quote-unquote culture and their quote-unquote Asian-ness. Asian values. Asian values. Um, don't know what those are, but wow, you know, this place is doing great. So maybe we should all be a fan of Asian values. It's an appreciation of the four distinct seasons of South Korea. <laughs> I, I like the seasons. You know, the, the winter can be a bit cold, but I, I like the seasons. Uh, summer can be a bit hot. Anyway, so what does South? What what do uh, what do observers not fully appreciate? Is how I would probably attack this question. South Korea as a society has, you know, it's the most rapidly aging society on earth. It is. A very, very rich place compared to most countries in the world. But I think that many of the problems that Western democracies are currently grappling with, South Korean democracy is also grappling with. There is a massive distrust in political institutions. The political class is detached from society and they're off doing their own thing with uh, the rest of the population most of the time until the Tristan Schill scandal at least completely disinterested in politics. Politics is a sport played by professionals for professionals, in other words. It's very similar in the UK. It's very similar in the US from so far as I know and so far as I, my trips in the United States and reading about it. But South Korean political life is not... It has its own specificities because it's a, it's a country and it's a different place with its own culture. But basically, the problems they have are very similar to the outside, very similar to the West. The one distinction, I think, is the immigration question. It does not have salience here, not to the same extent. It is not politically salient. And what I mean by that is you do not have political parties arguing over the numbers of immigrants uh, who should be allowed into the country. And you don't have a, one political party or multiple political parties which represent the interests of a immigrant community that is now naturalized and has voting rights. So as a result, you don't have the kind of right-wing national populism that you would see in Western Europe and with the Trump phenomenon. But many other regards, the general feeling towards the political class, the general concept of what the government can and can't do, that feeling of pessimism, which is so common across the Western world now. Things are getting worse. The economy is getting worse. We're on the wrong road, but there is no alternative and there's nothing else we can do. That kind of pessimism is very, very much present in this society, especially amongst young people. Rather than looking at this place as a distinct place with its own values, its own culture, its own food, that commonality to me is much more interesting. People may address each other more politely in, you know, or with more honorifics, but fundamentally they're still people. And I think that's something I'd really like to stress. I have heard some Western commentators talk about it. This is not a universal um, misunderstanding. But what I would say is that in Western analyses of democracies and political systems and in Western analyses of contemporary political life, South Korea just doesn't get a look in. And in many regards, it is very similar. And it, it's also different. And those, most of those similarities and some of those differences should be accounted for and discussed when we talk about democracy in the West. Because South Korea may not be in the West, but it's not quite as foreign as you might think it is. Okay. We're getting towards the end of the podcast. I have a few rapid-fire questions I'm just going to throw at you. And you don't have to answer in kind. You can take your time with them. What do you feel is the greatest confusion uh, about South Korea that foreigners have when they come to Seoul, when they come into Busan? Can we go political? Yes, we can go political. All right. Unification. South Koreans do not want to unify with the North tomorrow. Almost none of them would want that because it would entail lots of blood, bloodshed and it would be very, very expensive. The older they get, the less uh, opposed they are to it because... The less, they, less skin in the game they have, the further along they are towards death. But, you know, older people may remember uh, North Korea, of course, too. Some of them came over from the North during the war or before. But younger people, people at our age and between their, in their 20s, 30s and 40s do not want unification anytime soon. And they shouldn't. And the South Korean government has this idea of Tongil Kyuyuk, literally unification education. All we need to do is educate young people uh, about the need for unification and then it'll happen. And it's like, you're not talking about education. You're talking about brainwashing people into believing something is in their socioeconomic and political interests when it clearly is not. 
uh, anytime soon anyway. It's just a slow, gradual process that goes on for decades and decades and decades. If we redefine the whole concept of unification, maybe we can create the idea in people's heads that one day it'll be a good idea, but it's not a good idea anytime soon for South Korea to unify with the North. If you suddenly came across a million dollars and you had to invest 100% of that into any industry or any business in South Korea that would prove to be the most profitable in the next five years, what would that industry be and why? Care for the old. Why? Because it's a mushrooming industry. Like South Korea's growth was initially led by light industry, and then in the 1970s they they powered forward with heavy chemi- heavy industry and chemical industry, and in the 1980s and 90s they gradually moved up the value chain. Uh, at least that's my understanding. And became they offered more and more sophisticated cutting edge electronics, rather than yes. And now I I see China as taking over a lot of the taking a lot of market share away from companies like Samsung who produce this kind of stuff. And I think that given that it is a rapidly aging society, investing in care for the old, which I mean it's extremely morally ambiguous thing to say because you know there are many problems with care homes here just like there are in the west it's very very morally problematic but if you just want to make money then the care industry is probably a great place to invest in but i wouldn't do it (laughs) i wouldn't do it If it's about making money it's the care industry if it's about something else giving back being socially conscious then i wouldn't invest in the care industry i'd invest in north korean refugees who are starting businesses in the south because that's what i believe in what is your favorite part of korea that's not in seoul a city, a region, an island. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I was going to say Jeju, but it's very cliche. I My, thought you were going to say Dokdo. Uh, well, everyone loves Dokdo. You know, I, uh, no one wants to live there, but everyone wants to hang on to it here. I think there are a couple of fishermen that live there, right? Yeah. Two people. Stretching back generations to their great, great, great grandparents. Yeah. An unbroken line of Korean lineage. Is that true? No, not No, really. no. Well, you know, good luck to them. And... Uh, Probably, if it's not going to be Jeju, and Jeju is the obvious response, South Jeju Island is some of the most is one of the most beautiful parts of Korea, and the food and the air and the sea, it's gorgeous. But if it's not going to be Jeju, uh, which is now filled with tourists anyway, it's going to be Manjiri, which is in it's on the border between Chola Province, Chola Bukdo, Chola. Anyway, Chola Province, one of the Cholas and uh, one of the Kyongsangs. And it's gorgeous. It's an absolutely beautiful mountain. And it's food, food rounds there is great. You, you can trek along these paths up the mountain or around the mountain and go through villages and eat the local food, stay at the local inn. And it is an absolutely fabulous experience. And I recommend it to anyone who likes hiking and anyone who likes the idea of eating real Korean food, although you can get a lot of that in Seoul too, and someone who maybe likes the local alcohol. What do you think is the greatest misperceptions of the outside world that Koreans have? And let's say by outside world, uh, let's say the white world as we so politically. I was, I was, I was just going to talk about the misperceptions of Oman, but okay. Sure. And Oman, go. (laughs) I don't know. Unfortunately, I made a lot of uh, friends from the Middle East while I was in China, many of whom. Um, Did you say unfortunately? Unfortunately, I don't have any Omarian <laughs> friends, is what I was going to say. I have friends from Yemen, I have friends from Eritrea, I have friends from Saudi Arabia, but not from Oman, unfortunately. Um, misperceptions of the West. It's the same thing that you get in London with, white, with Western people in London when they talk about Asia. I think Koreans have a very indistinct understanding of the diversity of the West. If you talk to a Korean, it's, not everyone is like this, and I don't want to make grotesque generalizations, but at school, I always remember this. This was a very amusing experience for me. So I was listening to a lecture on So Young Hyun, Western Revolution history, and it was taught by a Korean, great teacher, really enjoyed it, and I learned lots of ridiculously useless vocabulary, which I nonetheless still like to use. And after one of his lectures, one of my fellow classmates came up to me, and she said, and it's like, literally, how are foreign universities? And I'm like, there are many different foreign countries in the world. Where do you mean? And of course, when she asks a white person, sorry, yes, I am white, what are foreign universities like? She's thinking, what's it called? The Anglosphere. That's what she's thinking. And a lot of Koreans have a habit of associating abroad when they use the word wiguk with America. And specifically, probably California and New York. And they don't take into account that there is a tremendous amount of diversity in the Western world. And there are many different countries with many different cultures there. I think that's probably the greatest misperception. 
If you had to fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses, which would you choose? The horse-sized duck. Mm. I'd get tired after killing, you know, a couple of dozen uh, small horses. And besides, they're gorgeous creatures. Like these, yeah, duck is, it, it's not even pretty as a small thing. Imagine it large. Oof. I wouldn't mind killing, uh, well, I wouldn't mind just knocking it out. What are three books that you would recommend, whether it be to better understand South Korea or North Korea, or just books that you've been reading recently that you really... I, I, I don't actually read very much in the English language about Korea. Um, sorry to all people who write about it. Now, there's some very insightful commentators, but I'm not very interested. Uh, I'm much more interested in just reading Koreans on their own country. But if I had to recommend some books that I have read and that I really enjoyed about Korea, I would first of all recommend... I recommend North of the DMZ, Essays on Daily Life in North Korea. It's a bit old now, but it's probably one of the absolute best books about economy and society in North Korea, written by my boss, uh, Andrei Lankov. And it's very, very fact-heavy. There's loads of great, really interesting anecdotes and facts. It's not overly analytical. It's just you know, what, a, what, a, what a post office is like in North Korea. How do, you get, what's a, how do you get a landline in North Korea? How do you get a bus in North Korea? This kind of stuff. It, it's a bit out of date now. It was published in 2011, and most of the comms were written between 2005 and 2010. But it's also got a lot of history, and it's, it's really, really great. Uh, let's see. What else would I recommend? Well, I, I know I'm not allowed to do this because this is a podcast about Korea, but I'm going to recommend my favorite, favorite political science book, which is called Ruling the Void by Peter Mayer, um, an Irish uh, academic who studied party systems in Western Europe. He's dead now. God rest his soul. And he basically explains why modern democracy, why turnout in modern democracy is falling, why people no longer trust political institutions, and why there is a growing tide of populism. And he wrote this book just in the couple of years before he died. And it mainly deals with Western Europe and, in fact, entirely deals with Western Europe and uh, the European Union. But most of the lessons in it are applicable to South Korea. He's very famous in political science for his idea of the cartel party, basically a party that has become almost entirely detached from society, has a has a very small membership, and whose leaders and whose representatives almost entirely come from a, a narrow uh, professional stratum of society. So the lawyers, the accountants, the doctors, the media media people, etc. And those lessons apply here just as well, if even if not better here than in um, in in Britain or in Western Europe. We don't we don't have mass parties in South Korea. And South Korean politics is dominated by a very very narrow elite, self selected. You know who all went to the Sky Universities and many of whom went abroad to study. Many of whom were already from rich households. I mean there are exceptions. Nam Hyun is the one that pops out in my mind straight away, but, you know, the few and far between. The third book I would recommend to understand North Korea is going to be Janos Kornai's The Political Econ- Economy of Communism. The political Economy of Communism or The Political Economy of Socialism, published in 1992. It is still pretty much the standard reference on planned economies. Now, I read loads of other books about planned economies, and I'm very, very interested in the sociology of the economy. <laughs> now, it sounds like an oxymoron, but it is a discipline within sociology. If you want a great place to start in trying to understand the mess that is North Korea, then after you've got after you've gone through Lankoff, you've got to go through Kornai. So those are my three books. As you see, um, two of them don't directly relate to Korea at all. And I don't spend much time reading in English about Korea at all. 